Chapter 9, Activity-Based Costing. In this chapter, we're going to look at applying costs based on production processes rather than accounting systems that tie back to products. We use cost accounting to aid us in making decisions. In this example here, the company is considering dropping one of the product lines. They're considering dropping the S72 line. We've seen charts like this before. We have costs for direct materials, direct labor, and in this case, we're applying manufacturing overhead, $40 per direct labor hour. And so if we drop S72, we expect these costs to go away, right? But we'll see that our estimates are not always accurate. We have 252,000 in manufacturing overhead. Method of allocating this overhead we chose is to allocate it based on direct labor hours. And so if that's accurate, we expect this $96,000 in overhead to go away if we drop the S72 line, right? And so we would expect that our overhead would be 156,000 after dropping the line. Well, let's see if that really happens. This next slide shows that total overhead didn't drop that far. It only dropped $18,000. The total was 252, now it's down to 234. So instead of saving 96,000 that we thought we were gonna save, we only saved about $18,000. This illustrates that overhead allocations aren't gonna be that accurate all the time. We do our best to allocate overhead accurately within cost constraints, because as we talked about, any sort of accounting system and accounting tracking is gonna cost money. So we have to pick a method of overhead allocation that's cost effective, but also produces decent results. But even though we do that, we see that sometimes we're gonna be off. And so in this case, we were really off because overhead between the two product lines are tied much closer together than we thought. And since we dropped one of the lines, but manufacturing overhead overall didn't go down that much, it only went down $18,000, then our overall total costs are going to be much higher per unit than previously. So the S66, it previously cost us eleven twenty five dollars per unit, now it's costing us fourteen fifty. dollars So dropping that line the S72 line really increased unit cost for the S66 line. One other concept to note is the death spiral. This is where a company that might be struggling, they're not as profitable as they want to be, then they might try to take measures that don't work out so well. They might try to increase price that would theoretically increase the profit margin, but usually it's not going to be that easy. When you increase price to try to meet product cost increases, then as we know, price increases leads to quantity demanded to fall. And so if your demand falls, then your overall revenue is going to fall. And so the company could overall lose money and lose revenue from the lower demand for fewer units. There's a term that we use in a in economics called ceteris paribus, C-E-T-E-R-I-S-P-A-R-I-B-U-S, ceteris paribus. And what that term means is all else equal. A lot of times we look at these decisions in a vacuum, like what if we raise the price and we can maintain the number of units that we sell? Well, if you can raise the price and sell the same amount of units, then that means that um, demand is inelastic, that price changes don't affect demand that much. And so you might be able to raise price to increase profit margin pretty easily. But in the real world, ceteris paribus doesn't always exist. So for example, minimum wage, that's a big thing that people like to talk about. They say that we can raise minimum wage, pay the workers more, which is generally a good thing to try to increase pay for your workers. But again, Ceteris paribus in the real world doesn't exist. If you raise minimum wage, 
for your workers, then that means your product cost goes up, right? Because labor is part of your product cost. Labor goes up, then your product cost goes up, then you might want to increase price, right? And so we've seen some of that in the real world where in places that have higher minimum wage, prices have gone up. And then so in a sense, it defeats the purpose of raising those wages because now these workers can't afford the products that their own company is selling. So there's no real easy answer to issues like minimum wage or price increases or product cost increases. There's always going to be a cause and effect. And that actually, there's going to be multiple causes and multiple effects anytime there are price adjustments or any other sort of economic adjustments that the business makes. So there's not necessarily a clear cut right or wrong answer, but just be aware that there are other effects that always occur anytime there's a price increase or product cost increase. Now we're going to talk about the two-stage cost allocation system. This chapter uses a lot of fancy terms, but these are actually concepts that we've already covered. So instead of assigning costs directly to a product based on a certain allocation rate, in this case, we can assign them first to departments, and then the departments determine more accurate ways to allocate those costs to the products or services. This chart shows us what we've been doing in the last several chapters. Direct materials can go directly to the products. They're easy to tie. Direct labor as well. Manufacturing overhead, remember those are going to be indirect costs. So in this case, we're doing a two-stage cost allocation. We're going to allocate the costs to machine-related costs and direct labor costs in this example. You know, depending on what kind of business you have, you're going to have different other departments. And then at that point, they figure out different ways to allocate these costs. So for the machine-related costs, they're going to allocate these by machine hours. And for labor-related costs, they're going to allocate it based on direct labor costs. Instead of in prior chapters where we had one overhead allocation rate and one allocation base, when the base could be machine hours or direct labor hours or direct labor dollars or a multitude of different things. In this case, in a two-stage cost allocation system, we can use different allocation bases. And here's another illustration of that. We have our unit cost for direct materials and direct labor. We have a sport model and a pro model of, of an item. And so for this company, they're splitting up direct labor into smaller subdivisions or departments. So you have your assembly and your packaging costs. And they also split up overhead similarly. They have their assembly costs and their packaging costs. And as we pointed out on the prior slide, you can have different allocation bases. And so for assembly, they're basing that on the machine hour and for packaging, they're basing that on the direct labor cost. And you compare that to how we used to do it or how we did it in prior chapters where we would just have one rate, in this case, 90% of direct labor cost. So compare that to the prior slide where we had two different allocation rates and two different allocation bases. The way we used to do it, which is simpler, is just using one allocation base and allocation rate. Now, again, there's no right or wrong answer here. If a company finds value in using multiple allocation rates, then that's a good thing. And if it doesn't cost them too much money, then that's a good thing. Um, but if it costs too much or if there's no real value in making your allocation bases and allocation rates more accurate, then perhaps just one rate is simpler and cheaper. And, and so maybe we would just go with the one rate. Another term you'll see is plant-wide allocation method. So this is another new term, but we've already seen the concept. It's just when we have one allocation base and one allocation rate. It says that all overhead costs are recorded in one cost pool and applied using one overhead allocation rate. So basically that's what we did in the earlier chapters. One set of rates. Versus a department allocation method, which we've already talked about in prior slides. Each department can set their own allocation base and allocation rate. 
and so that makes tracking costs a little bit more accurate. And so how does a company determine which type of allocation to use? Well, if they're creating similar products using the same resources, then they're going to probably use one rate. And if they're creating multiple products and these products are created differently and they use resources differently, then perhaps they'll use a department allocation rate. And so for activity-based costing, you're first assigning costs to activities, then you assign them to the products. So the concept is really identical to the two-stage product costing system that we just covered in the previous slides. A company is going to look at different activities, and if they can tie costs to the different activities, then they consider those as cost drivers then they might decide to allocate costs based on those drivers. So in this example, they're saying that maybe setting up machines have unique costs or handling materials, machining, and packaging and shipping. Those are all different types of activities, and they're going to have different costs tied to those activities. For this example, they determined that when you set up machines, um, a pretty accurate way to allocate those costs are per setup hour. For handling materials, production runs, they're going to allocate it per production run. For machining, they're allocating it per machine hour. And for packaging and shipping, they're allocating costs per production run. So again, this manufacturing overhead at the top, they're going to split it into basically four subcategories. And then they're going to allocate these more accurately based on different cost drivers and different allocation bases. So again, it's the same concept that we've done in the past where we've allocated overhead based on an allocation base and an allocation rate. But in this case, instead of having one base and one rate, we're having four bases and four rates. So I know that a lot of times these new terms might sound kind of intimidating and confusing, but really the concepts are the same as we've covered in the past. And here's what this information would look like in a report. Again, instead of seeing just one total for overhead, this total is split up into subcategories. So it's just another way to track costs a little bit more accurately. And depending on what methods we choose to allocate costs, of course, the unit product costs are going to be different. So if we do a plant-wide rate in this situation, the product cost for sport is $48. If we're doing a department rate, in this case, the sport unit cost is lower. And if we do activity-based costing, it's even lower. As compared to the pro line where the different rates seem to increase the amounts. So again, to emphasize, overhead costs are allocated based on estimates, and some estimates are gonna be a little bit more accurate than others, and so they're gonna have different numbers and results than other methods. Now again, to emphasize why a company may or may not use the activity-based costing method, any sort of method you choose are gonna have pros and cons. And the pro of using activity-based costing is that you might have more accurate estimates, but the con is that it's probably going to be more expensive to keep track of. And so you have to weigh whether the increased cost yields any increased benefit. If it doesn't, or if the benefit is too little, that it's not worth it, then a company might not use ABC. Also, the ABC system needs to be maintained, meaning that you have to keep up with the changing allocation bases and rates. And if you don't, then your numbers might actually be worse than what a simpler traditional system might provide. So again, in the real world, you have to determine whether or not a certain cost system is going to be worth the extra effort and the extra money, or if you can deal with just a simpler traditional system, that might be the better way to go. So again, this chapter covered a lot of new terms, but don't be afraid of them. 
they're all concepts that we've already covered in prior chapters. Now on to the homework.